This is our third week. This series, if this is your first time, just to give you a background of what we've been talking about the last two weeks, this gives us a, um, the goal of this series is to help us find out, am I really progressing and growing in my relationship with God or am I just stuck in one place? Because we said the last two Sundays that moving forward is essential. In fact, that's what we want. We want to move forward. We want to progress in every area of life. If you have a career, you want to move forward. Amen? Amen? Amen. Whatever your job is, you want to move forward. You want to progress. If you're a businessman here, you, you made X amount of money last year. You want to make more money this year. If you're in a boyfriend-girlfriend relationship for 100 years now, at least you're believing for your boyfriend to propose. You want to progress and move forward in every area of life. If you're a student, you don't want to be stuck in, at grade 4 and you're already 24 years old. Because all of us, that's our heart's desire. We want to move forward. We want to progress in every area of life. And the most important thing that we need to progress in is actually our relationship with Jesus. So this is what this series is all about, to be able to find out how will I know if I'm growing. There are growth indicators if you look at the scripture. Signs, or you can assess yourself. What are, how can I gauge? If you ask yourself, don't compare yourself with the other person beside you, okay? Uh, don't, you don't have to compare, but you have to ask, looking at the growth indicators the last two weeks, am I growing Am I growing? Am I moving forward? The first week we talked about is actually the Word of God. Is How will you know if you're progressing in your faith in God? Is If the Bible is part of your life, is it the priority and the authority of your life? Do you live by it? Do you read it? Do you prioritize it? The second one, last week we talked about what Jesus has done. So we need to have a growing knowledge of who we are following. If we're following Jesus, then you have to know him more and have a background of what he has done for us. So that's what we talked about, understanding the word of God and understanding of Jesus. And today we're going to talk about another growth indicator. Some of you don't know I have an, eight, an eight-old month baby. And so the last eight months, we always there, it's part of our schedule now. And if you're a parent here, you know what I'm talking about. You bring your babies at least once a month, every month, to the pediatrician. So we've been doing that the last eight months. Interesting, there's always a usual uh, regimen or system. The moment we go to the clinic, get inside the clinic, uh, the nurses in that clinic will carry baby Lucy, that's the name, and will weigh her. And then, of course, they'll write it down in the keyboard or they put it in the computer. It's systematic now that the weight has increased. And they'll also, and Lucy doesn't want to be stretched, but they stretch, him, they stretch her in a way that she complains, but they need to find the length. So they wanted to make sure if the baby's growing in height and in weight. Not only that, and that's, we do that every, not only that, but we also do that the vaccinations, the pricey vaccinations. It's getting more expensive, I guess. And so when you talk to the pedia, she'll, he'll show us the chart as well. There's a big monitor, an iMac monitor, where there's a chart. And so we want to make sure, and he'll show us, okay, your baby, mommy, daddy, your baby is here within the chart, so she's healthy when it comes to weight. When it comes to height, she needs to catch up. And, but thank God, she didn't get it from me, so she grew in height. But there's, there are growth indicators. We find out as mom and dad, as parents, if the baby's healthy and growing normally. Here's what I will not forget because every month he does it too. He says it to us, mommy, daddy, okay, as your baby enters this month, here, here's the keyword. Here are some of the milestones that you need to watch out and anticipate. And so I listen. Third month, I remember, okay, here are some of the milestones. I, I, I hope I'm correct, and my wife will correct me later. She's here. The doctor will say, does your baby, okay, in the next coming months, your baby will start rolling over. Oh, okay, has she rolled over? Not yet, but she will. You got to watch that. You got to anticipate. Okay, next time, your baby will start holding the bottle. And earlier, on. I remember she, he, the doctor said also, your baby will start cooing. What's cooing? Chicken pala, you know? Tumilaok, you know? 
cool. This growth, so the, the doctor was actually explaining milestones. And so we had to anticipate that. Thank God the doctor was right. We were worried. Oh no, he's not, she's not yet rolling over. She's one month old. She's one month old rolling over. And sometimes mommy gets so worried, she needs to rush. She's not crawling, hun. She's, hello. Okay, so, but now she craw- she's crawling. So there are milestones that you get to see and anticipate as your baby grows. You know, when you look at the Word of God, same thing. In your life, as you journey and as you continue to walk with God, grow in your faith, you'll see some milestones. You'll see some changes in your life. And you'll notice that. And you don't have to rush. Maybe if this is your first time or you brought someone here, sometimes we easily get frustrated. Why is my husband not changing? How many times did you bring him? Once. Eh, once palang pala Okay? I mean, sometimes we complain and the change is so f- slow. But you know, let me tell you, the monument, the indicator that you're actually growing in your relationship with God is life change. To some, it might take years before you see the obvious. To some, it might take months. It's impossible. To some, it might take weeks. So I'll, it's impossible. But we all, sometimes there are late bloomer Christians. Sometimes they catch up fast. They grow up fast. But one of the areas to be able to assess that we're actually moving forward in our relationship with God is this concept called life change. And when I say life change, I'm not just talking about behavior. I'm talking about different areas in, of, in our lives where you'll see it will change. That's what Peter was actually saying. What are, and that's what we're going to talk about. The bulk of this preaching is that for us, when you say life change, it's too vague. What is life change, right? Behavior? Is it my action? Well, more than that. Because Peter emphasizes three areas here, but for the sake of time, probably I'll focus on two. What are the two important areas in our lives that will change and that needs to change as we progress and move forward? Let's look at that. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13, it says there, therefore. Now, when you hear the word therefore, that means something happened before. In other words, when you say, therefore, in light of. It says here, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded. When you know what, if you want to find out what happened before or in light of this, then you need to look at the previous verses where Peter said what Jesus was talking about, what Jesus has done for us. And we talked about that last week. That when Jesus gave up his life for us and he ransomed us, he died on the cross so that we can all be reconciled back to God. That's the therefore. So that means there's something that took place before this and it's what Jesus has done for us. So in other words, this verse, what this verse means is in light of what Christ has done for you and for me and in light of now you have a relationship with him, this is what needs to happen. Prepare your minds for action and being sober-minded. Preparing your minds for action. That's the first area, your mind. That's one important area that needs to change in our lives. When we are growing and actually moving forward when it comes to our relationship with Jesus. And it says there, prepare your minds for action. Sounds like a war. Because it is a war. Other version says, gird your loins. Now, we haven't seen it because when we look at soldiers now, they wear pants. You ever watch Gladiator? Or those kinds of movies where um, they don't wear pants. What do you call that, Georgian? Palda. <laughs> okay, I don't know the English term. Skirt. <laughs> Skirt. You know what I'm talking about, where the warriors, Roman centurions, they don't wear that pants. It's a skirt. <laughs> Correct me if I'm wrong. But you know what I'm talking about? Then there's a sheath and a sword. But when you talk about prepare your minds for action, that's the picture that Peter uses. You, you're prepared for battle where you tighten that belt and the sword is ready. And you're re- willing to pull that sword from its sheath and kill some enemies there. 
So preparing your minds for action. So that's the picture. When he's talking to the Christians, he's talking to us, to the Christians. So he's talking about us and he's telling us that when you now have a relationship with Jesus and you're moving forward, you want to make sure that the mind is equipped for war. Why? Let me explain that. Joan of Arc said this, all battles, battles are first won or lost in the mind. We know that mind is a battlefield. That mind is amazing. It's, um, look at the person beside you. Make sure that person has a mind. <laughs> All of us have brains here. It's amazing. You know why? This organ can actually think and imagine the greatest of things. But also, this brain can also imagine the worst of things. That's why there are movies there. There are books there of the creative genius. There's, your mind is one amazing organ where you can think of the greatest dreams. You can, you, maybe you're daydreaming now while I'm speaking. You're thinking of great things, but you can also think of your worst fears. Amazing. In the mind, there are good thoughts that can actually draw you closer to God, and in your mind, there are bad thoughts that can turn you away from Him. And the mind is a battlefield. And so what Peter was actually saying, guard your minds. You just don't, the mind is actually, it's garbage in, garbage out. The mind actually absorbs everything. We live in a world now, Google, TVs, cable. So we, a, a lot of information out in the world and our minds absorb that. It's amazing. Ever asked, how do you sin? How how does it start when a person does bad things? You ever wonder, how does it start? Because the action is just the manifestation. There's actually a root cause there, probably in the heart. But before you even do the act of doing something bad, it actually gets marinated in the mind. Before you even do that, you're already imagining things in the mind. So Joan of Arc is right. I don't know if she's, she's a Christian, but the Bible agrees with it because all battles are first won or lost in the mind. Temptation starts in the mind. Hello? Doesn't happen instantly, right? It's not this one that did it. It's not this one that, of course, it did it. This one is the culprit. <laughs> it's the guilty one. It all starts here. In the mind. What Peter was actually saying, as you're moving forward and progressing in life, you need to make sure that the mind is ready for battle. You just don't absorb a lot of things because a lot of things in the world actually can turn, away, turn you away from God and can actually confuse you when it comes to your belief in God. It can actually, it can actually lead you to sin when this mind absorbs everything. There's a book if you, you read books, there's a book entitled, you read this, Jojen? You need to read this. You read it? The Screwtape Letters. This is a book that was written by C.S. Lewis, the one who wrote Chronicles of Narnia and a, a lot of books. But this one is a book that's very interesting. It's not scary, but I just thought it's kind of wise and smart for C.S. Lewis to write this kind of book. The plot of this book is simple. It's not about the lion and Lucy and the Chronicles. It's not about that. Two characters you'll see, maybe three. Two characters you'll see in the book, and it will actually enlighten you as you read it. The characters are actually demons. In the screw tape letters, the one, the, there's a senior demon, and there's an apprentice demon. Interesting. Why am I promoting a demonic book? <laughs> the book, the senior demon's name is actually Screwtape. So the letters came from him. The letters that he wrote actually was addressed to a, an apprentice demon. He's training. Parang Jedi lang. He's actually training an apprentice demon called Wormwood. And so the letters will say, to Wormwood. 
it's interesting if you read this book, one of the techniques that the senior demon was teaching the apprentice demon of how to attack a Christian is actually to distract one's mind. Very interesting. It's not scary. You can buy it in Amazon or you can buy it in Fully Book. But it's something that you will also agree because that's what Satan does when you look at the Bible. And C.S. Lewis is a Christian. It's amazing when you read it. And he will teach the younger demon, this is how you do it. And they call Christians as their patients. This is how you deal with it. You barricade. You know what barricade is, right? Barricade that person's mind so that he will not believe in God. And so Satan and demonic forces will put different thoughts and things in that person's mind so that they'll be confused and they will not look at, study the word and they will not put their faith in Jesus. That's what screw tape is teaching Wormwood. Barricade the mind and to distract the mind. And I, I think about what's happening in our world today where there's a lot of distractions there. Maybe there are things that you need to assess yourself now. What are the movies or shows that I shouldn't watch in the first place? That can actually be a form of distraction. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not giving you each list of show or movies you should watch, you shouldn't. I'm not like that. I'm not Rotten Tomatoes. But here's something that you can ask God, Lord, or as a family, you can ask God, Lord, what are the movies or TV shows I shouldn't watch? When my wife will check on that, when, when our baby's there and I'm watching this violent film and she'll just have, you have to switch the channel. Why? Baby pa lang. No brain yet. No, may baby brain, but it hasn't developed yet. Listen, no, 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 no. We have to make it a practice now that we have to be careful in the things you watch. What are not just the TVs or the movie shows, but also the books that you read? What are the books that you read? Sometimes, some of us, you need to burn some of those books. And you need to ask God. Because there are a lot of information out there and it can actually confuse your mind. Not only that, there are things that defile us in our world today and can actually lead us to sin. Because remember, temptation starts in the mind. Before you do that act, you're marinating it. Ooh, ooh, la, la, ooh, 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 praise the Lord. Oh, praise the Lord, pa. <laughs> but it's marinating in your mind. That's what Peter was saying. If you're moving forward and progressing, guard your mind. Screw tape letters. That's what the demons do. You ever reach out to someone who's close? You know, he, who philosophizes everything? Right? You, when you invite someone to church or share Jesus, they, they bring out all their shotgun and their weapon and try to close you. Oh, that's wrong. Why is, if there's God, why is there evil in the world? You know, you know those people? Now you know at the back of your mind, there are demonic forces that actually close their minds. And maybe the things they read or watch or confuse them. But don't tell them that. There's a demon. Don't say that. Pastor said there's a demonic influence. That's why you're close. No, you don't say that. Okay, don't say, get behind me, Satan. No, no, don't say that. At least at the back of your mind, there's some, that's something you can pray for. Last Sunday in the 6 p.m. service, someone approached me and who was actually repentant. And we prayed after the service. He, he was actually very transparent and open. He said, Pastor, I need to tell you something. I've been a Christian for a long time. I grew up in a Christian home. Good for you, I said. That's a blessing. But you know, I need to confess something because I've turned away from God. I said, how come? I turned away from God the last three years ever since I started reading that book. What book? Well, books about Gnosticism. If you don't know the word Gnosticism, you didn't miss a lot. The word about Gnostics. And he's been, he's been saying that. Gnostics, agnostics, barbecue sticks, and all those sticks. <laughs> he is... He's, what should I do? And he's asking me. He's very repentant. He's, he's sincere because he wants to go back to God. He felt the books that he's been reading turned, turned him away. I said, it's simple. Open your Bible and read it again. The books that you were reading, those Gnostics and Agnostics and everything and all those New Age, you burn it. Don't sell it. 
you'll make money and then you'll confuse other people, right? You don't have to sell it. You just have to throw it away and start reading the book, the Bible, and start praying again to God. And so we prayed. And so there are a lot of people like that. And you better be careful what we watch. Conjuring, body conjuring. You better be careful. I made <laughs> 50 shades of grape. I think. <laughs> Come on now. It takes wisdom on our part to discern what God is telling you. And I'm not saying which is which. I'm just saying you ask God and read His Word and be wise. Lord, what are the things that are unhealthy for me? And what are the things that are, will build me up? How about Pastor Moana? Moana. Okay lang. I mean, I, mean, I don't want to take time now to, to start discussing and analyzing all the films. No, I'm not... I'm just saying, more than just watching films and reading other books, go to the Word of God. Romans, Colossians chapter 3, verse 2, set your minds on things that are above. And that's what Paul agrees to Peter. Both of them agree, set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. How do you do that? Romans chapter 12, verse 2 is the same thing. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Renewal of your mind. So that by, by, that by testing, you may discern what is the will of God, what is good, acceptable, and perfect. So how do you do that? How do you guard your mind? I know whenever you reach out to someone, to some people, they say, ah, don't go there to that church or don't read the Bible, don't pray to God, they'll brainwash you. Yes, we will. Because if the brain is dirty, it needs brainwashing. How many of you here have a car and if it's dirty, it needs car washing, right? So the Word of God should and must brainwash us. And I don't see that as a negative thing. It is something good. Because that's what it means. As you progress and you move forward, you just don't guard your mind, you get cleansed and renewed by the Word of God. Sometimes there are thoughts. And Paul says this. Whatever thoughts, I know temptation is there. All of us get tempted. Bad thoughts come. And, and Apostle Paul was saying, when bad thoughts come, you take captive. Immediately you take captive. You don't marinate it in your mind. By the grace of God, you discipline yourself. The moment it's there, <laughs> okay, so this coming week, but don't be I like, be discreet. Don't, don't be like a crazy person, but there's a bad, <laughs> I don't know how you respond to that, right? You're talking to someone, you're talking to your boss or to your manager and then, this, there's a bad thought. It's hard, right? No, I'm not saying that. Here's a practical application. Read the Word of God. Now, temptation will still be there, for sure, even if you read the Word of God. So when bad thoughts come, okay, you don't have to vi violently react. You just have to pray. Take captive is, Lord, remove this thought. Okay, God, silent lang. Just remove this thought. If it's still, you're still struggling with it, maybe you can text someone, the one who's doing one-to-one -one with you, your small group leader, or the person you trust here in church, and text. Georgette, can you pray for me? I'm kind of having this bad thought now, and I don't want to sin, so I want to guard my mind. So can you please pray for me now? So there's power in agreement. That's application. That's practical application, how you guard your mind. Because you can't deal with it alone, right? You can't beat the enemy one-on-one. -on -one. You can't. You'll be beaten. So you pray, you read the word, you pray, and you ask for other people's prayers. That's how we guard our minds. That's, mind is prepared. That mind, this mind, is actually prepared for action. It's alert. When you say sober, it's alert. It's responsive. All of us go through that. And as you, you progress and as you move forward, you need that. Setting your minds that are things, on things that are above. The next verse here says, not just your mind, but set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Your hope. 
This is one indicator that you're growing as a Christian, that you, you're gradually setting your hope and your faith and your trust in the grace of Jesus. Before, probably, you were setting your security and your significance, your assurance on your career. Maybe some of us, we've been living for money. Or maybe we've been living for people's attention. If, there's, there are, if those things are not present in your life, then you feel at a loss. You feel insecure. But as a Christian, there's a gradual process that your hopes, your security and your significance will shift from these things now to the hope that can only be found in Jesus. So now your purpose will change, everything will change, the way you look at yourself, your security, your identity will change gradually as you shift your focus and your hope or your assurance on Jesus alone. When you, when you say that set your hope, it's like a picture of this one. You're familiar with this? An anchor. That's what this writers or Peter meant. If he can illustrate that to us, like an anchor. It's like a ship, right? Where there's an anchor and for the ship not to be swayed, even if there are torrents and it's windy or if it's the waves are there, if it's anchored on the ocean or seafloor, it's stable. So what actually Peter was telling the Christians is that you want to live a stable life in the midst of your trials, your temptations, or whatever you're going through, you set your hope in Jesus. And if you're moving forward, you learn to do that more often. That I'm making a decision to put my security and my significance on Christ alone. And when that happens, let me tell you, there's a change in motivation. Because the question of why am I living or who am I living for, the answer to that question changes as well. Because before, the question is, oh, I'm living for my career. Or I'm living for people's opinions. Oh, I live for the accolades of people. Oh, I live for my cars, for the material things that I have. You get to a point where these things will no longer matter. Maybe it's still too vague for you. But as you progress and move forward in your relationship with Jesus and set your hope on things, on Jesus, you will get to a point where the things that I just mentioned that before you were living for, it will no longer matter. Because at the end of the day, you're living for only one person. For you're living for an audience of one. And that's Jesus. Remember, when Peter was talking to the Christians back then, this was a time when the Christians were going through life and death situations. They were actually being persecuted. Peter could have said, save up. And there's nothing wrong with, th with that. Preserve your horses. There are no cars back then. Preserve your houses. You're going to die soon. He didn't say that. Although these are, things are important too. But he said the most important thing. He said, your hope in Jesus. Because you're going to die soon, anytime. Maybe some of us, he was telling to the Christians, and so it's better that you find a guarantee that will actually have a lasting impact even in eternity. Your insurance. You know your ultimate insurance? is Jesus. Set your hope in Jesus. And the other things are just secondary. When God gives you a great career, praise God. When God gives you money, praise God. But you know, you have to be clear, my hopes are not set on these things. My hope is set on Jesus. Because when I die and I'm in eternity, I will be with him. That's what it all matters. How many of you here, that's your faith? Amen? You know, when you understand this truth, it's easier said than done. I'm sure you agree with me. It's easier said than done. So you go back to the work world this coming week. You go back to your workplace. You go back to your family who doesn't know Jesus and who have a different values. 
you'll be forced. You'll be swept in again with that kind of culture. That's why you need an anchor. Because the anchor is, even if there's peer pressure and culture, the difference of culture in your world, you won't get swayed because your heart is anchored on Jesus. So whatever you're going through, whether you're going through some tough times now, or maybe all the temptations this coming week, or this week, all the temptations of the Satan to you, you said yes to. You know what I'm talking about? Parang perfect ka. All the temptations, there was no competition. I mean, before the demon approaches you, you already said, oh, gagawin ko na, no problem. That's like, you know what I'm talking about? You had a losing streak this week, or maybe problems you're going through. If that's what you're going through, whatever situation, you set your hope in Jesus. Maybe, yes, I can, okay, you, you've been in a losing streak this week. You said yes, and you sinned a lot of time. Listen, set your hope in Jesus. The righteous may fall seven times, but he rises up again. Why? Because of Jesus. How many of you here, don't raise your hands, you feel defeated, you feel condemned, you put your trust in Jesus. There's no more condemnation in Christ Jesus. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and purify us from all unrighteousness. If you're going through some problems, well, set your hope in Jesus. Problems are momentary. Yes, it's, we don't like problems. But how many of you hear God's promises are more valuable and eternal? Amen? We can, all his promises are yes and amen. I'm sure we did a lot of things that will find purpose, hope, meaning in our lives, but didn't work. Maybe it worked for one week, but you'll go back to your old cycle. And then he, Sunday said, but it's only in God that I found my hope. So that's my exhortation for us. This is what I'm proposing to us today. I'm laying down the cards on the table and asking whatever your context is, I'm telling us we can only find real and ultimate hope lasting peace and security and significance in Christ alone. And I pray as you move forward and progress, you will discover that. Might not tonight, might not be tonight, but as the days pass by, you'll discover that. I'm going to end with this story. A few days ago, we had a staff dev development class for the pastors. All the Victory Metro Manila pastors met and there was a class and from time to time, we sharpen our skills, our theology, so that we can minister better and effectively. And so we had a class. And the class is interesting because the subject was how suffering, how suffering can actually bring maturity to a person. And then we discovered in that class, God allows from time to time, we all suffer and we all go through problems. Because that's one important ingredient that will bring maturity to our souls. And then we were discussing and processing it. And then one pastor, who's a senior pastor, one of our pastors, Pastor Ariel Marquez, the senior pastor of Victory Alabang, if he attended that, um, stood up. Because he is actually the best person who can explain what suffering is because a few years ago, he lost a son, an eight-year-old son. He, has, he was supposed to have four kids, so one of his only boy, his son, actually died of TB meningitis. That was like 14 years ago, 2003. And so he was telling us the story of how he was able to cope and he was, how he was able to continue moving forward in spite of that loss. He was explaining to us that his son passed away. It was two months of in and out of the hospital and his son passed away. Imagine this, December 28th. In between Christmas and New Year. He lost his son. He was supposed to bury his son on the 1st of January so it will not... The wake will not be that long. But he can't because it's on holiday. So they had to wait from the 28th to the 2nd of January. So imagine what a memorable Christmas must have been, would have been, or must have been if he lost a son and celebrating New Year in a funeral home. 
And he was telling me that that suffering was so painful that actually, it's, he, this is how, the way he described it. It's like his heart getting stabbed thousand times. Is that painful? Yung in Tagalog yung hapde. Now I can feel his pain while he was telling his story because I already have my own baby. It's hard for a father to lose his. And you know, he, sabi nga niya, may tampo na nga siya kay Lord that time. Pastor, huh? A pastor who has, what's the English of tampo? Tampi? Resentment. <laughs> Grievance. That resentment. He actually resented God. Because he said, here he was, ministering to people after the service, every Sunday, ministering to people, praying for people's healings, and he was the one who witnessed that the prayer requests for healing for other people, God healed. He answered all those prayers, and, and here he was as a pastor, can't do anything about it, he lost his son. So there was a time where he resented God, questioned God, hard to move on. But here's the thing. Talking about maturity and going through maturity in the midst of trials. He said two things that actually helped him move forward and progress. He said, number one, it's God's word. That helped me progress. That helped me move on without any backstabbing or complaining against God. He resented, yeah, but he walked with God 100%. The word of God. I held on to the word of God. That brought comfort and peace. But the second one was actually the church. Important, special friends in church that would always be with them during those times. Especially December 31, when all people were celebrating outside, fireworks and everything. They were there in the funeral home. But there was one couple and the whole family stayed with him during December and he remembers that. Two things that helped him move on and progress. God's word and God's people. Share that story to us because it's God's word, motivation. Whatever you're going through, it can, you can actually set your hope in Jesus. No matter how difficult or or how hard it is now. You can all overcome and move forward as we set not just our minds on things above, but to set our hope on the grace, in the goodness, in the faithfulness, in the salvation, in the power of Jesus. How many of you here, whatever you're going through, I want to encourage you, you can all move forward. We can all progress. We can all grow no matter our trials or what kind of trials we're in. You will not regress. You can move forward. I know when I end with that for the sake of time, I no longer have time. There's actually one more point that I prepared, but we can set that aside next year probably or next two years. Anyway, we'll see each other every Sunday. Amen? Let's all stand. That's why trials still help us move forward. It's not something that will pull you down if you don't have God. But if you continuously put your hope in Jesus, you're anchored there, you won't be swayed. You'll progress and move forward. So I pray for us. I don't know who you are, but I sense in my spirit, some of you here today, you're in that context. You think you've, you're gone. You think you're far from God. Oh man, I said yes to all the temptations this week. Oh, I'm drowning with the sea of problems in the sea of trials. Listen, set your hope in Jesus. Set your hope in Jesus. Your trust and your confidence cinch on Him. He'll pull through. He'll pull through. Why so downcast, oh my soul? Put your hope in God. He'll take care of you. Let's all lift our hands to God. Lord, I pray that we will continue to move forward. Now we know that this is what distinguishes us from the rest of the world. Our hope in you. Set our minds on things above. Transform our minds each and every day as we read your word. Help us take captive of every thought and throw it out 
and we want to dedicate our minds only to please and honor you. So continue to change that area, Lord. And even our hearts. Is that motivation, Lord? I pray you would change that. Maybe some of us, Lord, we get our assurance, our security, our identity, our significance, and other things. But Lord, even tonight, help us discover this truth and to be able to live it out. The truly lasting hope and lasting significance can only come by putting our trust in you. Help us understand that each and every day. And so whatever my brothers and my sisters, that are, whatever they're going through tonight, pray, Lord, that we will learn to set our trust, our hope in you. This coming week, may we be able to do that, Lord. Bless our jobs, Lord. Bless our careers this coming week. Lord, we're putting it in the right place. It's secondary. You're the first. Bless our business. Bless our household. Bless all the things we'll be doing this week. May we be a blessing to other people this coming week, Lord. Continue to change us inside out, Lord. May your righteousness, your peace, your favor be with us, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. God bless all of us. Have a great week this week.